Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us today to stay curious. Today with Mikey Haddad, expert in space shuttle payloads and an expert because he wrote this book, okay? <laughs> Shuttle payloads. Mikey, great to see you. Good to be back, Mark. Well, you're, nice well, happy to see you. You took a little vacation break there, but you've been coming around here since November 2020. Mikey's been sharing his vast amount of knowledge about the payloads of the space shuttle, as we always are happy to celebrate the 30-year era of the wonderful, fabulous space shuttle that has changed our, our, our world into the 21st century. And if you want to Proof of that, just go out and look at the space station going over. Yes, sir. Because the space station, Mikey's doing what we're going to talk about today in 1991 and 1993, true life science, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, these are, are space lab missions that focused 100% on life science. A lot of the missions before this would have bits and pieces of life science. These were dedicated 100% to both life science. And, and so. life science is defined as... Uh, basically anything in the body, your blood, your heart, your blood vessels, skeletal, um, kidney, organs, um, all that kind of stuff, space adaptation. Do you get, um, you know, how do you get, if you get sick in space, um, bone density, loss of bone density, muscles, anything basically to do with the human body. These two missions were used to determine what the effects of space has on your human body and long-term effects kind of thing. So very dedicated, all dedicated directly to life sciences, yeah. We're talking about STS-40 in June 1991, one of our shuttles of the month of June, and STS-58 was in October, two years later. Uh, very long missions, two weeks in space with mm -hmm. seven astronauts, one bathroom, <laughs> okay? Uh, so they really had to get along with each other. And we know that Joe Bruce is watching in Spokane, Washington. Daniel DeYoung, our, our Spirit Airline pilot, he said he'd be watching today. Uh, ISS 83 is watching, and when I looked up on Facebook, they're bemoaning that they're leaving the Space Coast, but I couldn't tell where they're from. Oh, okay. Uh, Sharon Lozada is a friend of yours. Mm -hmm. uh, no Sharon, yeah. Was she on the uh, a Level 4 oh, engineer? Gosh. Yeah, tie, somehow tied in. I, again, it's been so long ago. We got uh, Gary Gerald's watching in Collins, uh, Georgia. I've got some Vidalia onions you're going to go home with that Gary brought to oh, us. Oh, sweet. He brought, yeah, they are sweet, <laughs> too. Uh, remind oh, me. Oh, yeah. Uh, and thank you, uh, Gary. And uh, Dave Stangy's watching Macomb, Michigan. Uh, uh, AF Oliva is in uh, our Space Coast here. And the Code Blue Collective is watching and marty's been writing that name down can't find out much about you code blue collective but say hi to marty winkle over there uh, uh, uh mikey is uh marty's the man he keeps all this electronic stuff going for us that's right we are looking at episode 843 wow. of stay curious since we Good were born out of the pandemic that's awesome so it is it is pretty awesome deborah johnson is up there in my buckeye home state of kirkland ohio uh, Kirkland's the city of faith and beauty, as they say, east of Cleveland there. So <laughs> a bunch of you chiming in early when you saw Mikey's face up there. You're going to be watching today. So we're going to hear about Space Lab uh, 1 and 2. And uh, we want to remind everybody that we're going to be closed on Monday and Tuesday, July 3rd and 4th, as we celebrate America's birthday. So uh, uh, if you're making plans on the Space Coast, plan to come here on Wednesday. All right, we'll be taking a break also from Stay Curious on those two days and recharging the batteries for a, a good summer ahead here. So, uh, Mikey, there's your book. Uh, 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 when was it printed? Uh, where can we get it? Actually, it was a July or January of last year it was printed. And um, it was basically, and you get on Amazon or on the, um, um, the site that the, the, you know, it's from Springer Publishing. You, you wrote this with a David Shaler there, yep. and David and you, I'm going to... David's from the UK. Right. So he was across the pond. So him being in UK and my, myself in the United States wrote this book. Imagine we, you could do that. Over, I know. <laughs> people separated by an and, ocean. Uh, we did a Google Meets with David Shaler, and we're going to get back up to doing that. But uh, uh, Marty, that looks good, lined up really good on our uh, visuals here today. And David's basically, excuse me real quick, Mark, David's a, a, a professional writer. He's written dozens of books. He all has. The He's Gemini the program. Book yeah. So is there. Look and up his name. Up Very his name. readable, but historically yes. accurate about the Gemini program. Yes, I know he's written about Apollo. 
11 and stuff all like that. Of, so uh, yeah, all kind of uh, he was a good guy. We need to get him back on Stay Curious here. Sorry, and we wanted to thank you, by way of thanking you for your support, wanted to look back a little bit at some of the people you brought on here. Maynette Smith is, is, uh, was uh, one of your colleagues, and she talked about... Uh, what was her expertise? Structures, I think. Well, and working on the payload behind it was those the the the, the cell array deploy mission. That was kind of the payload she, she worked on and was able to get all. And I know Maynette's probably watching. She's been become a a, a stay curious watcher. So hi, Maynette, and uh, Scott Bongen there in the center, and Louis Delgado on the right. Mm -hmm. uh, really great guys that you've introduced me to, uh, and uh, Scott Vaughn in the middle. Bongen, I mean. Uh, could have gone to space just like you were going to find out uh, had uh, uh, you know one of the astronauts that was going got sick we're talking about mission specialists right well Scott was actually what was called this payload specialist hey I mean yeah Marty straight me out mission okay. specialists uh, can be a spacewalker right Marty payload specialists are the ones that yeah, mission specialists are like a full-time astronaut their right. career is an astronaut a payload specialist basically focuses on one or two missions so they're they're picked for that specific mission and then they go back kind of to their regular job. So they're not career astronauts, but again, they fly in mm -hmm. space in a critical of course of payload ops right. because they're the experts on the payloads. Yeah. And we're going to hear more from Scott. He's really been involved in uh, all kinds of things. Uh, and there you are with uh, Damon Nelson. Damon Nelson. Uh, and another person that you brought on board here with us. Yeah, in fact, he had a, he had a part in the SLS missions, integrating some of the hardware for SLS. Oh, did he? And we're talking okay. about Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. Damon was a good one. Uh, they're all good. They all bring insight, their expertise, and like Mikey, they've been so excited to talk about what they've done. And here's astronaut John David Bartow, uh, who we were thrilled. To, he came in while we were closed one day, uh, putting carpet down, mm -hmm. and we kind of gave him a tour, and uh, uh, we hope to get him involved in our Shuttle Fest 3 when we talk about Astro 1 payload and some of its problems there. But uh, need to get JD back on. Uh, he's he's local, lives around here. He'll be at the Space Center uh, this weekend, I think, Marty. Yeah, doing the astronaut encounter, yes. Yeah. Bartow. He's here uh, tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow? Okay, I need to get out there and see him. I kind of laid off going out there, but I need to get back out there. And Tracy Gill here with some space flown hardware that was pretty cool that mm -hmm. we, uh, we yep. talked about there. So uh, well, Tracy's just... still out there doing work. He's working on all the new futuristic uh halves and that that will be going to basically on the moon yeah. oh is he tracy's still an active part very active part of what's going on today in the, in the space program yeah. well we'll get him back on uh tracy had this to say in the preface of your uh book here oh, okay yeah, I want great to quote. yeah it's a great quote he said every time i saw a space lab mission lift off i got a very special feeling inside that lasted about two weeks That'd be the length of the mission. <laughs> uh, the performance of the experiments in the space lab uh, was an unqualified success every mission, and it would be hard to be more proud of the work we did. The fact that we got to work with that we got to work with a bunch of great people from KSC, other NASA centers, and from around the world, as well as working on a new complement of experiments every few months, made it a fun, exciting, and interesting job. It could easily be called a passion rather than work, says Tracy Gill, uh, electrical engineer there. So, uh, and that's what we want to echo uh, with Mikey commenting about these missions, these two important missions today. Uh, I'm going to set it up with their their interest there, but I uh, thought that was well put and well said there. Yeah, Tracy, him. yeah. Uh, the shuttle of the month of June, uh, we're going to highlight STS-40's June there. That's the triangle up there. Uh, we had um, uh, Sid Gutierrez on this as a part of our local hometown rocket company via space. Sid's in the upper right there, uh, standing up. Beside in the middle is uh, uh, Millie. Uh, uh, no, that was uh, Tammy Jernigan in the yeah, back. Yeah, Tammy Jernigan. Yeah, yeah T Tamara Jernigan's in the back there. And uh, you had. Uh, uh, Brian O'Connor is the pilot there to, beside her. Rhea Seddon and, Mil uh, Rhea Seddon and Millie. Uh, Rhea Seddon's on the right, mm -hmm. and Millie Hughes Fulford's on the left there. We're going to see some pictures of them in space. And uh, James Bagnan uh, made one flight to space up there. This was a 10-day mission, the first with three women on board. All right. 
And Mikey, I like talking about the the uh, the patches and the uh, and I'm just going to indulge myself in reading about these patches and then turn it loose on the Mikey. But SCS40 folks, there's so many things in these, right, Mikey? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. The patch focuses on human beings living and working in space. Against the backdrop of the universe, each of the seven crew members is represented by a silver star mm -hmm. in the orbital path of Columbia. The flight path forms a double helix representing DNA molecules common to all living creatures. It affirms the ceaseless expansion of human life and American involvement in space and emphasizes the medical and biological studies to which this flight is dedicated. The phrase, Space Lab Life Sciences One, defines the mission and the payload. In the upper center is Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, with one foot on Earth and arms extended to touch Columbia's orbit. He represents the extension of human inquiry from the boundaries of Earth to the limitless laboratory of space. Uh, he links scientists on Earth to scientists in space. At the center of the patch is a red and yellow earth limb linking earth to space and radiating from a Native American symbol for the sun, which links America's past and future. Beneath Columbia, the darkness of night rests peacefully over the U.S. This patch was created by artist Sean Collins. Wow, a lot of... Well, a lot in that yeah. little patch there, but I think it beautifully states what the mission was. Mm -hmm. Yep. And... Uh, in there so then we're also going to talk about in october was flown the same configuration somewhat with different creatures involved involving this crew sts uh, 58 mm -hmm. uh which had three rookies on board including uh, uh david wolf who become an experienced astronaut his first of four flights martin fetterman was the payload specialist yep. that you guys uh, could have replaced uh, him Maybe if he'd gotten sick, right? And uh, then we have Rhea Seddon, William MacArthur, Richard Surfoss was the pilot, and John Blaha there, uh, upper left standing up there, was the commander, his fourth of five flights. He stayed on the Mir space station. He had an awesome, awesome career. But here is what that patch represents. The STS-58 crew patch shows Columbia in orbit around Earth with a space lab module in its payload bay. The space lab and the lettering Space Life Sciences 2 highlight the primary mission of the second space shuttle flight dedicated to life science research. An extended duration orbiter support pallet is shown in the F payload bay. Okay. Uh, stressing the scheduled two week duration of this, the longest space shuttle mission to date. I love this. The hexagonal shape of the patch depicts the carbon ring. A, co a molecule common to all living organisms. Encircling the inner border of the patch is the double helix of DNA representing the genetic basis of life. Its yellow background is the color of the sun, the energy source for all life on Earth. Both medical and veterinary caduceus are shown to represent STS-58 life science experiments on the left and the right there. They flew rodents and a whole bunch of Goldfish? Jellyfish. Yeah, oh, jellyfish. Jellyfish. All right. Uh, did they take any Krabby Patties up there with them? <laughs> they do a lot of stuff on orbit we never find out about. Yeah. <laughs> okay. They did some jellyfishing up there. And uh, uh, you'll be talking about that. Finally, the position of the spacecraft in orbit about Earth with the United States in the background symbolizes the ongoing support of the American people for scientific research intended to benefit all mankind mm -hmm. and the crew designed this patch which was often a exercise of the commander seeing who was going to be artistic mm -hmm. and who was going to be yeah. uh, dominating and things like that on there uh, anything to add to those patches that i think so beautifully set up yeah that basically tells the story there the missions here and you had your own patches, Mikey. Yeah, those are basically just, these were focused on just the space lab life science. So this is basically payload. These Think of these as the payload patches, mm -hmm. where the ones you were talking about were kind of the mission patches, overall mission patches. And again, SLS-1 and SLS-2, and you can see the different, again, very similar as far as, you know, some of the graphics and that. Um, and again, the helix you see on SLS-2. Um, 
again, I had actually a copy of that SLS tool. We used to have, we used to make cardboard cutouts to put in the user room. And I was going to bring that, and I didn't get to bring that. But basically, these are the these are the payload patches. And so for every mission, you'd have a mission patch, the crew to design, and then of course you'd have a payload patch, especially if you had a component of three, three or four different payloads. Each payload would have its own patch for that mission. So these are the SLS yeah. ones, yeah. Yep. And patch is an important part of space history. Like we've read there, there's a lot of hidden meaning, a lot of pride in yep. in creating them, and it becomes the moniker or so forth of that of that mission. For that mission, yep. That payload, yep. Well, Mikey, I'm going to turn it over to you here to, okay. to, to share with us. Tell me to advance the frames when you need them there. Okay, well, this is basically a graph like we show in a lot of them, showing the STS-40 configuration with the module and in the back of on the shuttle on this flight was a gas bridge. Again, gas stands for getaway specials. Think of it, their experiments about the size of a keg of, keg of beer. Mm -hmm. And this one had what was called a bridge where you can actually put 12 getaway specials on one bridge. So this is very unique. Um, so this is kind of the, the payload configuration for STS-40. Okay. I want to share that. And then, of course, the next one shows, now again, it looks very similar here for SLS-2. The difference here is instead of the gas bridge being in the back, they have what's called an EDEO PAL, which is extended the orbit extended duration orbiter pallet. And what that does, that has cryos on it, it in essence extends the mission of the shuttle beyond like 10 days. And so for this one, they actually went 14 days. And so this provided enough power they could run all this science 24 seven for 14 days. And so that's kind of why this was a little different configuration uh, than, than STS-40, which is a shorter mission. Okay. So the, the astronauts get into this. You're going to see the inside of all this in a minute through a tunnel. Yeah, the tunnel there okay. from the crew compartment. The very front part is the aft flight deck or the flight deck and the mid deck. And then from the mid deck area, they go through a tunnel to get in the pressurized module where a lot of the science is located. And we'll see what that is here, I think, in the next. So you got a pilot and a commander and then five other people on there that are that are more how involved are the pilots and the commanders in this well it depends on the mission see some of the missions um you do a lot of over over attitude control you need to have the order pointed in a certain orientation for the science mm -hmm. uh, so they, they're involved a lot uh, some other missions maybe not as much if there's no not a lot of orbiter functions that have to support the space lab then the crew and uh, or the commander and pilot definitely participate they keep things going keeping them organized of course they're running the mission um, then you have the mission specials, which kind of do the science, a lot of the science, a lot of engineering, a lot of the orbiter functions, and then you got the payload specials, which there's two on each of these flights, and they're specifically focused on the payload ops. Okay. Their job is anything to do with the payload, and so that's why there's two of them, one for each shift. Um, so that's why it makes up about the seven seven crew members that, that fly. It, the, uh, it, it's, a, it's a team effort. It's a big coordination, a lot of integration, a lot of back and forth. I mean, you'll see in some of these photographs that come up how... Um, Different nationalities, different things. Now, what I want to do here, I want to show, if you've seen this before, this, again, is the operations and checkout building, and we're, we're looking um, east from the west side of the building. And the reason I wanted to show this again was kind of this is where a lot of this activity, pre-flight activity happened. Um, now, in here, of course, we talk about level four, which is, the, and I want to try to make a distinction here. It's going to get confusing, but we have areas of the, of the building where there's different areas, different levels of integration. Level four is kind of the piece parts where it all came together, which is in the foreground. And as you move back, you go to what's called level three, two. Level three is where a different organization, McDonnell Douglas basically prepares the pressurized module and its subsystems. Level two is where our, our experiment racks and that module come together. That make, becomes level two and you do all the testing. Then level one, which is back by where you see the, the number 10. And remember, the site stand, which is cargo integrated test equipment. Uh, remember that location because there's a photograph coming up later that, that specific talks about it. So it's like an assembly. Way in the back. Way in the back there, yeah. up there. Okay. And I wanted to mention here because, again, level four is only a, a, a part of that. It's, it's only, you know, one area of the building. Then you have the level four organization, which is the people. Okay, well, we're going to leave it here just for a sec, yeah. Um, and so as things went on, you had level four people. They would actually work in level three, two, and level one. So was it level four, level one, level three, two? So it got very confusing. And so what we did is we actually modified the terms to where the people actually became what's known as experiment integration. The all the other people that supported all all that and did a lot of the other space lab work became space lab. And then the physical locations were level four, level two, level three, level one. So then when we start talking about like level three, two, where we call space lab, they had an integral part. They basically prepared the module, the floor. They had a lot of activities that they did. You'll see as, as we go on here, a lot of the major moves of the hardware was done by our Level 3 Space Lab people. 
installation in the payload canister, removal from the payload canister. They supported a lot of the flights. And there's another group here that we don't show is the people over at the hangar, Hangar L specifically, where they prepared the animals. Okay, our job was just get the animals from the hangar onto the shuttle and then post-flight removal. There's a whole group there that has to prepare these animals for the mission. Huge effort, huge effort. Hmm. So there's a whole group of people that have to make all this happen. And I wanted to point this out because level three, two, level one, and all the work that those space lab people did, um, we integrated as a team. Level four experiment integration, space lab, a lot of the other work that was done, and of course the hangar people for the, all the animal work. It's very, very complex. A lot of organizations working together to pull these missions off. That's why I wanted to show this again, kind of just a, a highlight of what we, for people maybe in the past that hadn't hadn't seen this before. And the, you can imagine, folks, when you're dealing with animals, even 1991, you know, 30 years ago, a lot of uh, safeguards, a lot uh, of requirements, a lot of requirements to treat them humanely, things yep. like that. Absolutely. Uh, and I believe I'm reminding myself to ask you about how a small Learjet was rented okay. after the landing. Period. Okay, we'll talk about that when we get the landings. For, that's, for, uh, that's a real good story uh, there. Uh, there uh, yeah. Okay, great, great. Uh, we'll make sure of that. But also, the ONC operations and checkout, checkout is now the Neil Armstrong Building. That's the famous building where the astronauts would walk out to the the uh, uh, van to go out. That's where their yep. their uh, one of the floors there is their uh, uh, the crew quarters. Crew quarters, yeah, crew quarters there, and then all this was moved into the space shuttle processing facility later on. Uh, when we did space station, yeah, a lot of this activities were moved into the space station. There was some early space station activity done here as the space lab was winding down, basically. The far half of that, the building is kind of cut in two to where we did start some of the space station integration in this building and then eventually moved to the space station. Okay. Building. Yeah. Just a little knowledge there for you all space geeks out there. So, okay. So, this is, you know, when you can see this, but this is basically the space lab complement. You got racks, the racks are basically those large angled structures. You got one through 11 on the left, which is the port side. You got two through 12 on the right, and you got the center aisle. So, all this stuff is basically packed into this module okay and that was our job each of these racks were individually assembled tested in fact uh, one of the things damon talked about was um some of the some of these racks the drawings weren't quite um very accurate so he spent a lot of time basically installing electrical cables the fluid lines a lot of the experiments the electronics kind of just get it done just stuff it in there and so it was it was a, it was a it was a trick yeah. to try to get some of these but our job basically was each of these racks were offline, basically in a different area. We had to assemble and put all the equipment into each of these racks. And then each of these racks were assembled in this configuration for kind of an integrated module. Those are individual little racks there. Okay? Right, where you see and the numbers. Yep. Where you see the numbers are they're individual units. Yep. And if you've all worked in a, a laboratory or a medical laboratory or... You uh, had to do a class in college that involved a lab. Mm -hmm. Just think about taking all that stuff with you to space, and yet that's just you got it. You're in a confined space. Yes, sir. And elbows to elbows, and so, uh, uh, so how much training did the astronauts actually do inside there? Well, they, they, they did a lot because when we power up for flight or testing or doing certain activities, the crew loved to come down because this is what they're going to see on orbit. This is the flight hardware that's flying with them. And so they wanted to be standing in front of that and spend as many hours as they can in front of, in front of the actual flight items. So when they get on orbit, they get, they're get they very familiar with it. Now, this is more of a close-up view. This is kind of a better view showing just some of the hardware. You see, this is the, this is the port side, uh, racks 1 through 11. You can see the kind of racks and all the equipment installed, and there's the title of all the experiments that are on there. And then also this part, this graphic includes all the center aisle stuff. So you can see this is basically packed with a lot of stuff. And the idea was to pack with as much as you could because you want to get as much science as you can in the 10, 14 day mission. And this is the starboard side showing the different things. And what I want to point out was a general purpose workstation and then the other one was the RAF on the, on the previous slide. We're going to kind of focus on those two. Yes, where it says research animal holding facility. We're going to kind of focus just on those. There's so much here that there's no way to Number talk about three it. there yeah. on the top. That research would be RAF three, yeah. RAF, okay. Yeah. And um, then this next one was where you showed the... Uh, uh, yeah, you can go to the next one. And then, of course, rack um, 10 is a general purpose workstation. Okay, so we're going to focus on those yeah. two. Mikey, was there a lot of competition? How were, how was it chosen? Who flew what? Well, how special flows. How, how was it? I mean, that's a whole uh, years of probably... Really good question, Mark. That's a whole other process. And how 
this stuff got selected for this flight. There's a whole other process way up front because actually mm -hmm. these missions were talked about in 1978, as early as 1978. And this one was really? actually... flown in 1991. Yes. Yeah. This one was actually, SLS-1 was actually what they called Space Lab 4 at the time. Uh -huh. Okay. SLS-2 was Space Lab 10. So you can see back in then they were planning all these Space Lab missions. Well, over the course of the years, it went from Space Lab 4 to SLS-1. Mm -hmm. It went from Space Lab 10 to SLS-2. And so the process of figuring out what gets picked is a whole other animal. So we basically get in, they selected the hardware it's going to fly, and that's when we kind of, okay, hey, this is everything that's going to fly in this flight. That's when we kind of get integrated into the process. Right. Yeah. Okay, so this is basically the RAF, a close-up of the RAF. And the this, animal. The, right. it wrote, yeah, it's basically a research handling facility. And then this one, there was rodents. Each, each cage contained two rodents, 12 cages, 24, 24 rodents. And you can see there's a feeder tray and cooling and water and, you know, uh, removed the, the, the um, uh, waste tray. So they were, they were treated, you know, they were basically, these enclosures were meant to, to try to, you know, keep the rodents as comfortable as possible in, in zero G. And again, this is just one rack. This is the rack. It's a double rack. And you can see this is just one of the racks that we had to integrate. Okay, yeah. the basic structure of the rack was the same. The guts, everything got stuffed in here was our job. There, there was, was to a, assemble, and this is the general purpose workstation. Um, again, some of this hardware would come in a main assembly, we'd just throw it in the rack. Other ones would come in piece parts, and we had to assemble all that in a rack. Hmm. And so this is the one, just as two of the racks that we had to work on, basically to assemble just two of those, and then of course you got you got a total of, of 10 that we did, the experiment. Um, and so that was basically, I just wanted to show those as two kind of specific ones. They were big, big time racks for this mission and, and the follow-on mission. Well, we're going to have Terry White on, who you know, the OPF, Orbital Processing Facility Manager, the garages of the low, of the, uh, uh, so the shuttle, so to speak. And uh, so I'm begging the question here, Terry, uh, the, uh, with ter and asking you, Mikey, uh, the rodents and live, live creatures, they were not, how, when did they load them? We uh, they, they weren't loaded in the orbital processing facility because uh, it's going to be out on the pad for two weeks or, or two right. months. Right? It was loaded within probably usually 24 hours of launch. So, and there was a specific operation that we'll talk about here in a little bit on how you get these animals in the shuttle when it's vertical at the pad. Okay. Yeah, and it was, we can show that. They had a, a great bit. program about that the first time I think you did it. Yes, sir. Uh, with monkeys. Mm -hmm or primates on there, and uh, we'll talk about that later. And, and I just wanted to bring up one more thing. There was another gentleman sure. who worked on this called Dick, uh, uh, they were a buyer, um, that he talks about working 18-hour days, and he lived 45 minutes from home. So he says, I didn't go home. I take my, my, my the bag that basically had all the clean room stuff, he uses a pillow, and he'd go to sleep under his desk because after 18 hours, it's 40 minutes drive home. He's not going to fall asleep right away. He sleeps a couple hours. 45 minutes to get back, he says, it's not worth it. It's not even worth going home. So many days, he would sleep under his desk. Why was he under such a timeline? It like was that? the time was trying to get all this hardware integrated and tested before the flight. But usually what happened was, is you have a launch date. That's fixed. Okay, so you start integration way back here. Well, if things go wrong, that launch date really doesn't slip. Unless it's a they good don't reason. want to slip. They don't want to slip it. And so all, all that stuff, the problems you have, starts crunching things together, which means you have to spend more hours to try to catch back up to make that schedule. Hmm. So they worked really hard. Yeah, there's a lot of people worked long hours to get all this hardware basically integrated and tested before the flight. Well, yeah. we're talking to Mikey Haddad here on a great Stay Curious program. He's appeared over a dozen times here talking about these payloads. And I know you all are learning things you uh, didn't know before. Marty, we got a good group of our core watchers today. Didn't want the list. Well, uh, sure, we get the list. Uh, Mikey's probably got a few friends watching there. In, in, yeah, I hope you have a few friends anyway. That... Yeah, and I probably <laughs> won't talk to those because you, I, I butcher people's names, Mark. Yeah, so. <laughs> well, well, we got Maynette's watching there, and okay. uh, Chris Callie's watching. And Chris, uh, we're going to promote your T-shirts here in a little bit. We got Cynthia Rossi and Gary Gerald, uh, Steve Hammer, Bill Whiting. Sandy Owens is watching. Dave Stangy and Doug Forrest. Doug's in Los Angeles. Dave's up in Michigan. This is awesome. Uh, this Christopher is Mick, uh, he's an educator in Hudson, Wisconsin. He was out here at the uh, STEAM event. I heard that you were out there, uh, Christopher, Okay. Uh, last week. Uh, Space Monkeys up in Gainesville, Florida up there. And we'll say hi to some of you others here, here in a minute there. So we're enjoying Mikey Haddad telling us about 
two uh, missions that how much you think of this 30 year old knowledge translated to what's going on at the space station today well a lot again a lot of the space lab missions were a precursor to, for station ops uh space lab again you can you know, like we're talking here maybe two weeks of course the longest i think was 17 days so you're limited on time of course space station months years you can be up there so the things that they learned on space lab they then apply to what could be extended out for many many months on space station so a lot of this was precursor to station ops yeah a lot of what we did okay now this one again this is this is where our level four or our level three two or space lab people coming in they, they did these moves these huge moves this is the rack train that we assembled together but now our space lab friends their job is to move it and get it into where we can install it in the so it's suspended in the from the blue crane there right. is the space lab yeah you got the basic two two it's a double overhead crane so two cranes trying to sync up with each other at the same time that big blue structure lifting this whole complement of space flight hardware very complex operation and again as our space lab friends mcdonald douglas did, did was responsible for these operations okay again you, if you watch neural lab this is basically i love that picture yeah this is basically the inside of neural lab and you've probably seen this during the, but the reason i wanted to talk about this again was focus we focused on the racks in the back which is what we the again, gray for. angled racks right back there folks. this is experiment integration now the people in the foreground and you see the pressurized module and all ex ex electronics down there in the bottom that was our space lab folks they were responsible for prepping this module to get it ready for the experiment wrap train that we were integrating and so they had a lot of work they had to do and i want to make sure it go, it's, it's clear yeah. that it just wasn't us. McDonnell Douglas had a huge had part three, six, in Space Lab people. and, and the, the, the Space Lab people that did all this work on getting the module and all that work. And all these huge moves, major moves, it was them that did that. And we supported, of course, but they were, they were responsible. And you could imagine. So this is basically a, a picture of the racks before it went in the module. Okay, now the next one actually shows the racks actually starting to slide into the pressurized module. Mm -hmm. Again, this is what we called level two. This is the level two area because the module we were we were preparing level four the racks the module itself was level three well when those two pieces come together that's called level two and that's what we're doing right here shows level two integration the racks going into the module and of course then we do all the testing in that uh to make sure all this hardware is going to work together and so you I got about a half inch clearance there to work with that's oh, tight very very tight very tight clearance yeah and this is basically now this is the inside of the sls module this is the center aisle this is actually you saw the graphic earlier this is actually the flight hardware this is showing the flight hardware on the center aisle and you see the protective the chair there's a chair there for... there's a chair an ergonometer basically a bicycle and then um and then you got some other things kind of in the foreground there and then the pads those are protective pads we put down over the over the floor we okay. wanted to protect the flight hardware so this is basically when we're doing testing um, so you, you see those those tan the white pads that got the green triangle yeah. or rectangle and stuff or those are protective they pads. Wouldn't go to space as so you guys yeah wipe your feet on those yeah because the flight it. floors are actually the gray structure that's underneath and of course we would pull these pads out before the flight okay now this is basically a picture in the sight stand this is what we call level 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 one which is um basically this is the stand where we tested all this all this payload hardware we tested it against a simulated orbiter okay so we'd say hey is there anything between the payload and orbiter that doesn't work we want to fix the problems here we don't want to wait till we actually get to the shuttle and find we got a huge mistake or a huge problem and so this is basically in the site stand this would be the last stand in the operation checkup building this is now on the east side this is from that other picture looking to the far end and of right. course this is a picture of all the people <laughs> that it took for this flight yes yes crew and the blue flight yeah, suits the there were hundred people there folks involved with this so. so it's a huge organization it's a huge amount of people it takes to pull these missions off and that's why i wanted to show this picture was to show it's just not us in level four it's just not level three two or the space lab it's uh -huh. not experiment integration the contractors, hundreds, contractors, the contractors, it's the, hundreds uh, of people uh, to make these missions possible. Uh, you've got universities involved, and in, oh yeah, and in, in international for some of the international flights, we got foreign governments, international companies, international um, educational academia. Mm -hmm. It just depends on the mission. This is all basically for uh, states, yeah. Well, here's a little article in your payloader magazine. Uh, yeah, this was basically our space lab people. They put out a payload, see McDonald's logo up at the top. This is one of the payloads. This is basically telling about what's going on with the payloads. And this one specifically was STS-58. And this, what you see is a shuttle kind of up up and down at the launch pad. 
And in the center there is what we call the module vertical access kit. Basically, we had to hang somebody on a hook. You go in through the crew compartment, you go on a hook, you go down through the tunnel, across what we call a joggle, which is kind of a 290 degrees, and down into the lab. And that's how we put these animals and all the, all the science that had to be late loaded. That's how it was done. So there's somebody hanging on this hook for hours. And kind of what it does is he's down there hanging on a hook, and the people above, there's actually three different um, hooks that are coming down. He's on one, or he or she is on one, but it's mostly he. And then the other two are used to bring things up and down, basically, to load in. So while he's there, we'll be pulling up one hook, lowering another one down. He'll take that, install it, and while they're bringing it. So it's basically a really orchestrated effort. And again, this is hours before launch. These, so had, to go, before launch. these right. had to go smooth because if something happened, and this took twice as long, we basically bought launch. And what they've got a container that's got a live creature in it, yep. whether it be a monkey or rats or, or whatever. Some, some something live or some or samples that had to be so, made. So to that has to look. be just right so they can put it in there. Right. Uh, and and that's, me, that's our friends that did that, yeah, prepped let, everything. Let me read what this says at the end. At times the, the uh, technician must hold their arms out in front of them as they swing around into a Superman posture. Uh, and that these hanging techs are strongly advised, quote, not to drink too much coffee <laughs> if they have a four or five or six hour job ahead of them. Because <laughs> they're down there for the duration. So. Yeah, right. Yeah, we so, can't bring them up. They got to stay uh, down there until and, we're and done. There's a John Oliver a mod tech there. I'm sure you know John yeah. Oliver. And uh, they call that the uh, Modular Vertical Access Kit or MBAC. M MBAC was MBAC. what we had. And, uh, and we use these on a, on a series of flights, a lot of flights. And we'll, and we'll, we'll do a whole show about that one day as I get up to speed and learn about that but uh so let's go back again to 1991 and those high-tech computers everybody okay. was using yeah actually one thing interesting about this sls mission it was the first mission space lab mission was actually managed out of jsc but marshall was still responsible for a lot of the on-orbit payload ops so you had where marshall normally would do kind of both now we had johnson space center and marshall so now we've got a whole nother space center involved in all this so it was interesting because it, it, different space centers do different things um, and so the process is, you know, we kind of had to learn, uh, but it worked out. And so this, I just want to show a picture of the Marshall POC, which is the Payload Operations Control Center, uh, where they basically operated the, uh, the experiments that flew on the flight. And again, you can see this is 1990s, the old style computers. Yeah. So I want to say a little to our Marshall friends for um, basically all the work that they did for on orbit. And of course, all the, they were involved in pre-flight and post-flight as well. Cutting edge stuff in NASA yeah. Marshall, 1991. Yes, sir. Okay, this is a Tammy journey, and this is back by the General Purpose Workstation. This is a picture from on orbit, and I wanted to show Tammy. Tammy's a real good friend of mine. I've known Tammy for a long time. Well, we kind of met back in the Space Lab days, and then I actually went to Houston for a while and, and spent some time talking to Tammy. Um, and so still kind of in touch with Tammy. Um, very, uh, very, very good mission specialist. Awesome, awesome woman. And so I just want to show a picture of her basically on orbit. Married to an astronaut, Peter Wissoff. Yeah. Uh, uh, in there and uh, but the, yes she's uh, Tammy actually uh, let me get there while we're looking at her she flew um, uh, this was her first of five trips to space yeah. man she was an, she was awesome uh, can you believe uh, yep. the, the five trips to space and there's a uh, Millie uh, Hughes uh, Fulford who passed away a couple years ago cancer she was a mission she was the payload specialist again a payload specialist specifically picked for that flight or flights yeah and they don't get astronaut wings. I found that out when we asked Charlie Walker, yeah. payload specialist. I asked Charlie, where's your astronaut wings? In your sock drawer or your wife's jewelry case? <laughs> and Marty can tell you, he looked at me like I just told him his dog died. Uh, he, he goes, I don't have one. Uh, missions payload, yeah, payload specialists didn't get a, their... Uh, and again, this, this picture too is her in front of the Loraf. So I wanted to show those two things. Now again, this is back in the pressurized module. Here is actually the mid-deck of the shuttle. And again... They're doing activities for the mission in the mid deck, so you can see. I guess they're getting ready to James take some James Bennigan's taking yeah. uh, the uh, uh, Brian O'Connor's, uh, or Drew, or I think that's Drew Gaffney, maybe. No, it's Brian O'Connor, I think, taking his blood. So there's activities going on in the mid deck, activities going on in the space lab module, all to support this mission 24/7 to get as much as you can in that mission because there's only it's only up there a few days. And this is um, SLS two with the rotating chair. We're heading off to the the right there. Um, just another again one of these experiments where they they test basically if you, how to get how you, you try to keep you from getting sick in space. They get try sick. to make you sick in space. I'll try to make and, you sick and, in uh, space. To, so, uh, 
because the inner ear, the vestibule, all that stuff of the inner ear is really a, uh, not doesn't like space uh, in some some people. About a third of them, I understand. It's amazing. There's some that never get sick on the ground, and within hours they're sick in space. And others that get sick on the ground never get sick in space. Hmm. It's it's yes, yeah, it's it's hit, it's hit and miss. There's no rhyme or reason. So this is basically to understand how that affects long term. And again, you can see, again, this is on orbit and all the stuff, cabling, and all the stuff that had to be. And, of course, as we're thinking long term, as Hazel Banks is watching, Carlton Bailey, James Sigler, Denny Noah, Melissa Pope, and Maurice Kurzowski is watching. Welcome, everybody. Uh, Thank you. Welcome, right. everybody. Marty's got me there. Sharon, uh, yeah, Sharon uh, Lorenza. Sharon Lozato. 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 Ryan Ewinson. All right. Thank Welcome, you. everybody. Thank yeah. you so much for tuning in. Uh, this is awesome. So, so tell us about how a Learjet was, uh, why you had to rent a Learjet after the landing of SCS-40, uh, and for uh, what my notes say here, uh, to fly three or four miles. Okay, yeah, again, it's from our friend Darren Beyer. What happened was, is after the mission, our job picks up again once the flight's done. And we're basically the second, second group in. The flight surgeon goes in, gets the crew out. Our group goes in to get the life science activities hmm. out. Well, the way this was worked was down at the other end of the Edwards, where this landed at Edwards, is where the scientists were going to receive the, the, the science, basically equipment and stuff that would flew on the mission. Well, because it was in kind of in another area of Edwards and it took a long time on the road, this is we can't wait that long to be able to get put this stuff on a vehicle and drive it on all these roads to get it over where we are. So we're going to rent a Learjet. We're going to have it near the shuttle. So basically, we pull this stuff off of the shuttle, we hand it to these people in the Learjet, and they literally fly three miles over to the other runway on the other side of on the, the other, other side of Edwards space, Edward space <laughs> to get them the science as quick as possible. Wow. That's how that's how critical the timing of this life science stuff was. Huh. And so Darren was telling that story about yeah, he supported that. He says it's wild to see them rent a Learjet for only a three mile trip. <laughs> I can see the bill on that, Darren. Yep. That's what you got to do. That's what you got to do. Uh, there's so many other things yeah. there. Marty, he's got a question there for you, Mikey. Yeah. Yes, sir. Got a question from Carlton Bailey, and I'm going to read it the way he wrote, <clears throat> way he wrote it because I think he's missing some periods or something. Anyway, is Mikey no out of curiosity? What happened to all the surplus? I guess you call and payloads after I returned and never used again. For example, any of the astronomical telescopes. They might have been mounted outside to look or something. What did they end up in the government surplus sales? Very good question. Yeah. Uh, to answer your question, a lot of times the instruments themselves would return to the universities, um, the, the government organizations, NASA, the NASA centers. The major instruments would return to, the, to those locations. A lot of the other hardware then would be dispositioned. Uh, some of them would get sent to museums. Uh, some of it would be, you know, basically access. Some of it would basically sent to scrap. Um, so it varied, yeah. Very good question. Um, and it just depended on the mission and the hardware, kind of where it went post-flight. It kind of just scattered. And in fact, that's part of what we're doing for the Astro Restoration Project is trying to find a lot of that hardware that flew on Astro where it is today after 30-some years. So that's, that's a very good question. But yeah, it was a, it, a variety of different post-flight history of this of this equipment. It, it would vary from going back and being pristine in a museum to basically getting sold to scrap. So I just ran up on and ran some road out ran there. Road. Yes, Kennedy sir. Space Center, the famous dump they have out there. Yeah. Of space artifacts, and like you said, Mikey, you're very involved with the restoration of the astronomy telescopes, uh, so they can be put in the Smithsonian. Yes, sir. Yeah, that integration is going up. It's basically reassembling the Astro One and Two payload complement. That's being done at Marshall Space Flight Center right now, and eventually end up in D.C. How's it going? It's going great. Yeah, yeah we've got it. It's on display up there at the. Um, uh, U.S. Space and Rocket Center. They're basically their visitor center at Marshall Space Flight Center. You can walk right up to the hardware. There's a little um, rail around it, so you can't get too close. But, uh -huh. And you can, you can see this is the flight. And what's unique about this, and Scott had mentioned this a while on one of the other shows, this is one of the few instruments that actually came back. Okay, Hubble won't come back. Webb won't come back. A lot of the planetary, a lot of the other satellites right. ones don't come back. Astro did. And so here you got a, a telescope package that flew in space that now people can see the actual stuff that flew in space. So that's what we're working on, try to restore that. Well, that yeah. begs my question that you, I know you can't answer. Why don't we have a telescope on the International Space Station? It'd just be a great 
yeah. fun maybe thing to look through. And I'm sure they'd be looking down. I, I'm not going to say they probably have some, maybe a spy telescope <laughs> they haven't told us about. I, I uh, don't know. Yeah, good question, Mark. Yeah, yeah. But being an amateur astronomer, let's put a telescope up there so everybody can look around a little bit there. Well, uh, put the button on our space lab here, and we're going to move to another little segment here with Mikey, where you actually uh, were hoping to be a uh, payload specialist at one time. But uh, I keep emphasizing these missions 30 years ago. This is the science that's being done right now on the International Space Station. And yeah. I know you're not an investigator on this, but in general terms, how did these do to set the the, the bedrock? For well, it was amazing. Of course, SLS, when you have a, a reflight, SLS-1, you have little glitches that you have to work out. SLS-2 is almost flawless. And so the data that they receive from those missions can then be used to enhance data for long term. Say, okay, they were in space 14 days. What did it do to their muscles? What did it do to their bones? What did it do to their blood vessels? Okay, they can compare that with say now you're six months you're right. on space station or you're nine months or you're 12 months in experiment. So how does that change compared to a two week mission? And so it basically a lot of that information, that data was almost like say a base baseline or ground groundwork for then all the other stuff that's occurred on station. Uh, related to life sciences, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it was it was huge. It was it life was... sciences has benefited our great shuttle era there. Uh, then the uh, of course the uh, the science that's being done uh, up there and the metallurgy and so forth. That was yes. a whole other world of oh, payloads yeah. that you were involved in. Yeah, in there. So yeah. Uh, Mikey, we appreciate you sharing with us sure. these important missions on there. I want to uh, show everybody a little bit that, that yeah, the NASA always embraces these things. Uh, here's the Space Lab uh, 1 uh, public relate. I'll have you hold okay. that. I got a coin in here somewhere. Uh, very detailed. You may have gotten these in the 1990s about the investigations other, going other, on there. That's gold, Mark. That's uh, gold. Is it gold? Yeah. Here's here's one, an Earth, uh, Space Lab User's Guide uh, from, uh, oh, I got to put my glasses, of course, to read that. The the year I'm trying to look for the rear. This is point joint published by ESA, November 76. Okay, talking about just what you're talking about today. All right, with the... Uh, Space lab there. Yeah, because kind of give what it is is the, and, the space uh, lab equipment was actually designed and built in Europe uh, and then sent to the United States. So we I used dropped it. that. There was a coin that uh, uh, the, the first flight of uh, a space lab there, that's actually commemorates STS 9. Okay, which is Space Lab 1. Yeah, which that was, was John Young's lab. last mission. Yep. He was famous on that. And, uh, well, I got a, someone trying to call it here. And then again, <laughs> Uh, there's uh, J.D. Barto with uh, Lauren Acton. And Space Lab 2, yeah. Space Lab 2 on there. Not Life Science 2, just Space Lab 2. Just yep. flip that over, Marty. Thank you, sir. And we've even got a Causeway Pass on that first mission. Oh. Oh, it's yeah. green. You can't see green. <laughs> so, so you can't yeah, see yeah, Causeway. <laughs> it's just, invisible. Yeah. If I hold it sideways there. Okay. <laughs> you can try the back of it. Maybe the back of it you can see. <laughs> yeah. That's what everybody wants to see, me hidden there. So, <laughs> anyway, we just, uh, uh, yeah, some reminiscent things. A lot of good stuff there, there, Mark. There, so. uh, well, Mikey, thank you so much for about life sciences here. We just want to talk briefly uh, about here. Uh, Marty, do you, would you uh, let me put that up there, and then we go here. Would you like to become an astronaut? All right. And uh, you did. All right. Well, it's close. You were close. It was close. Uh, uh, and actually, yeah, that was kind like of Scott Vaughn, or Vongen, and, and and several others of you there. But uh, here's the criteria. Here's the steps for applying that you. Yeah, this was back in '98. Basically, what happened was back in 1998, I was the finalist for the astronaut corps. Um, so this is basically the 25th anniversary this month, wow. June of 1998, when uh, the astronaut class of '98 got selected. Well, this is just a couple of things that happened. First, you send in your application. And then there's this group, basically, they take every application that comes in, and they basically take 10%, <clears throat> excuse me, which is called the first cut. The top 10% is selected of that. And then what happens at, at that point, you get your um, uh, references contacted. So basically, when you apply, you wait to say, hey, did the reference get contacted? You, you call your references. Oh, yeah, they called me. Whoop. I made it through the first cut. Wow. I made it. I'm top 10%. Okay. So that's, that's huge. Okay, I'm, I'm a top 10%. And so then when they talk to the um, 
references and they get more information about you. And then if they really like you, you'll make the second cut. And what happens then is they actually send you to Houston for a week. And they run you a bunch of medical and physical and psychological tests. Um, because that's basically when you get sent to Houston for that week, in those groups of the people they pick the astronauts. Okay. Um, in our group, there's basically six groups. Normally they have five. But they had six for class of 98. I was in group six. And again, I'll have a little chart here. So there's actually four of us from Kennedy that got into the class of 98. And then we got fought in the finalists in the class of 98. Um, and so it was 21st, 25th anniversary. There's the four people. Nicole Passimo was Stott at the time. Um, basically, or Stott now. Um, she was actually one of the four. Scott Vaughn, which you've, we've talked about. Cheryl McPhillips, who's another level four person, and myself. Now, none of us got selected. Now, Nicole moved to Johnson Space Center in 98, and she was selected then in 2000. Yeah. And she flew a number of missions. Nicole, very successful, very, very, you know, super. Good friend of our museum. Nicole yeah. Stott, of course. And I know Nicole St. well. Petersburg. Yeah. And so basically, Scott in Group 4 and then Cheryl and I are in Group 6. We didn't get picked. One of the things I wanted to talk about was, um, you know, Scott was actually uh, four times he made it to the, he, he was a, selected to get in the final group. He never got picked. Um, and I, I put on this, and again, it's, it's a little bit of my soapbox here. I apologize, but I just tend to say this. You know, over 64 years and all the astronauts selected, only three were picked from Kennedy Space Center. Um, I personally think that Scott, especially during the Space Lab program. He yeah. knew Space Lab inside and out. The man was a genius. He got picked as a payload specialist. Again, the difference is payload specialist was just for the Astro mission. He went back to his normal job. This is getting picked as a full-time astronaut. Yeah. He should have been picked as a full-time yeah, astronaut. Scott Bongen, yeah. I know he's probably watching. Because, because um, you know, his knowledge of Space Lab, and, and he basically, and to me, it's just, there's so many people that are, and hopefully today, um, there's a lot of people still try to get in from Kennedy Space Center. I think there's a lot of good people at Kennedy Space Center that should have been, should be, and still today should be picked as astronauts. That's just my my opinion. And then down on the bottom are the actually the three that did get picked. A K hire, she flew two flights. Again, very good, awesome mm -hmm. astronaut. Uh, Frank, who unfortunately never did get a chance to fly, he passed away in 2000 from cancer. And a Johan Botham who flew an SCS-116. So basically, those are the only three astronauts over 64 years and 360 astronauts. They were actually from Kennedy and got to fly. Got to get picked as astronaut. With an so my back for Nikki. Yeah. She was a Kennedy. I, I think for a there's while, a lot but... of people that, that should be yeah. picked in, in, uh, in for astronauts. Yes, sir. Uh, well, we've had several people that were washed out. You know, didn't didn't make it six or seven attempts. Uh, and uh, you know, it's uh, I think somewhere down the line it becomes more of a uh, not what you know, but who you know. And it's a tough job. And I know nothing against the astronaut selection office. They have a huge job trying to pick from all these people to pick, you know, maybe a dozen astronauts or something. So it's not a knock on them. It's just I wish that more people from Kennedy uh, were picked to fly in space because I think there's a lot of good. It made too much logic. Now, <laughs> come on, that's uh, again, it's Mikey Haddad's opinion. So yeah, please, I don't want to get anybody else in trouble here. It's just well, we've opinion. enjoyed our time here with you as usual, Marty. We have any final comments there before we wrap up another Stay Curious? Good. Hey, we're we have we've had no uh, anomalies the last few uh, shows here. We've had some real frightening <laughs> yeah, anomaly things work. going on there. There is a uh, uh, Mikey's book there, okay, and uh, we uh, appreciate it, buddy. You're just uh, sure, you're absolutely. Just, I always love being here. We love being here. A lot you're of gonna, fun, sir. Uh, getting to know you and getting to understand this has has been part of uh, what I've been enjoying doing. And uh, we keep repeating some of this stuff that sticks with me. So hope that you've all enjoyed this program about America's Space Shuttle and what it did 30 years ago to find out about how our hearts ticked, how our lungs breathed, and how our ears figured out how to operate zero-G Yes, sir. in there. We want to mention we got Terry White, the orbital processing chief, will be here tomorrow with his son, Travis who is a major in the Army and watched his dad while he was in uh, Afghanistan, was it, Marty? I think, so, yeah. I think he was in Afghanistan. We're really anxious to meet you, Travis, and proud of your dad in there. Here is uh, Terry there at uh, Atlantis. Uh, of course, uh, Atlantis, big doings tomorrow where they're going to celebrate mm -hmm. the 10th anniversary of it being a museum yes, sir. artifact. Mm -hmm. Are you going to go out there? I'm going to try to get there, yes, sir. At 11 yeah. o'clock, Marty's when the astronauts are going to talk to the public under Atlantis. I think I'll go out there and check it out and bring you all a picture of that here on Stay Curious. Marty, I think you, you intend to go out there? Yep. All right, we'll see you out there. 
um, talk to our astronaut wrangler, Nick Thomas. They're probably going to still have the astronaut 11. Yeah. I think 11 and 2 o'clock. And then 11 o'clock's when the, the ceremony is at Atlanta. So, well, we'll be torn to doing that uh, in there. Uh, and here we've got uh, Dave Stangy on the left and uh, Larry Pushkar on the right. And the look on me and Terry White's face is bewilderment that you don't own a T-shirt by the Callies, all right? Uh, there's Dave wearing the Paul Callie Neil Armstrong, and Larry Pushkar's wearing the Chris Callie Gemini 4 spacewalk there, and just, we're dumb, we're just stupefied <laughs> that, 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 that nobody's buying these because they're not $25, they're not $22, they are $20 plus shipping. Hit the QR code there or go up uh, on our Facebook page and it's pinned up there. We want to uh, $20 plus $10 shipping. If you, you buy two of them, we get two of them in there for the $10 shipping. Stock up on a, a Christmas gift, a late Father's Day gift, whatever on there. So mm -hmm. uh, which one do you like? I like the one in the center, to tell you the truth. Do you? Yeah, the Armstrong. Well, I'm going to make sure you walk home with it. Walk oh. out home with that today, <laughs> Thanks, my Martin. friend. So in there. So uh, but uh, seriously, these are awesome T-shirts. I was at a local restaurant. That's nothing special except the good food. Their t-shirts, 25 bucks to the tourists. So these are 20 bucks, real art by real artist, Mr. Paul Kelly, who passed away 12 years ago, and his son, Chris, who's a great friend of our museum there. So, and another reminder, we will be closed Monday and Tuesday to celebrate America's birthday. So God bless America. I'm a flag-waving, uh, uh, stay curious, uh, person here so hope that you all are out there and i got one other thing real quick mark talking about restaurants for people that knew moon hut back yes. in cape canaveral it is reopened as moon hut okay and i so am those people the are out there in the world and have gone to moon hut it is reopened again have and you eaten there yes it's very good they kept the whole back room all the patches and awards it's just beautiful it's a really if you get a chance to go yeah, there's a big a new moon hut uh uh painting of a, like the moon yeah uh with a face on it uh and all kinds of sign stuff back there i saw john glenn well, they and kept Shepard. all that stuff good, from all those good. decades of space well, i read a few reviews they do breakfast lunch and dinner or breakfast and lunch right now eventually it'll be doing dinner okay so well, yeah, I heard that egg benedict open. and stuff like that was on the uh, menu there, i got so. their biscuits and gravy and eggs and oh my gosh it was awesome okay <laughs> was well awesome. We're, gonna, we're gonna check that we're gonna check that out for sure yep. the moon hut cape canaveral not too far from my favorite Beach site, the Buchanan Beach. Okay. For all the, they have the streets named after the presidents there. And we're just making you people all over America and around the world watching Stay Curious a little bit jealous, but don't be too jealous. It's 90 degrees every day. We're into the summer storms and so mm -hmm. forth. So yeah, uh, lightning and uh, fun stuff, but uh, uh, I, I like it. I'd rather be hot than cold. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. On there, Love so. it here. We're in paradise. Well, Mikey, thank you again. You're welcome. Appreciate thank you, you for having me. Such a great Appreciate friend it. of ours here at the American Space Museum. Uh, Marty, another great Streamlabs job today, error free. We're so pleased with that because we got again tomorrow uh, Terry White, who was the manager of the orbital processing facilities, and his son Travis, one of our warriors protecting our nation as a major in the Army, are going to be here to help you stay curious. So until then, I'm Mark Marquette saying, Book your vacation here and come and visit us at the American Space Museum. I want to bridge the space between us. See you later.